May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please do grab a seat. Bob Dylan, way back in the day, famously sung, The times they are a change. Hands up if you're a Dylan fan. Come on. Let's, let's see those hands up. The times they are a change. Uh, times were changing, you know, then, and times are still changing now. The times they are a changing. Whether it be climate change, or change to morals, or politics, or people's attitudes, these days are in a state of upheaval. But this is not the first time that people have lived through great change. Our Old Testament reads they take from Isaiah 35, is taken from a time when the Assyrians were threatening God's people in Jerusalem and Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel at this time had already collapsed to the Assyrians, and with this overthrow, northern refugees were pouring forward, looking for a new home and safety. The conflict wasn't just coming from the north, it was coming from all around them, actually. Whether it be the Philistines from within, uh, the Egyptians from the south, the Babylonians from the east. They were all turning their attentions towards God's people and God's capital city, Jerusalem. In response, what is Judah to do? What are the leaders to do in this kind of melting pot of, of conflict? They were trying to navigate their way through this political turmoil wondering, you know, what's the best uh, route to take? And by and large, they forgot about God's ways and God's laws, and they acquiesced to the Assyrian uh, army, worshipping the Assyrian deities, paying taxes to the Assyrians, and supplying them with people in their armies and materials uh, for their forces. So the historical backdrop to Isaiah 35 is one of threat, one of uncertainty and one of compromising to God's laws. So it's not a good, it's not a good time. But amazingly, amazingly, what we find when we follow the biblical narrative right throughout the Bible, right throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament, is that when God's people stay faithful to God against all the odds, it results in them being victorious. When God's people stay faithful to God, in God's ways and God's laws, against all the odds, it leads to them being victorious, being on God's side, on the winning side. <coughs> and our Isaiah passage today picks up images not <coughs> uncommon to the land surrounding Jerusalem and in the Middle East. It's an arid and dry region. But in the midst of this desert, God provides a wonderful vision of what God will do to bring renewal to the world. The wilderness and dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. <coughs> we know, don't we, that in times past, God provided water in the desert for his people, bringing water from the rock at Horeb. And now further hope is being provided by these images that speak of a transformed desert, a transformed region. Desert conditions will find release, and creation itself will be glad and rejoice with joy and singing. And we know, don't we, right from the beginning of the Bible, that creation itself has been frustrated since the curse because of Adam's disobe disobeying God and bringing sin into the world. In Genesis 3.17, uh, God says, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. Speaking of the hardness and hardship that exists in creation, uh, the hardness of humans uh, sustaining life uh, on the earth. And this theme is picked up again in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we know, don't we, if we look around our country uh, and we hear stories of wild animals travelling further and further uh, in search of water, uh, or whether it be you know, farmers right across our nation 
uh, with no grass for cattle or sheep to eat, or whether it's stories of bushfires in Tasmania and Scandinavia, places which don't normally have uh, bushfires, or whether it be the molting polar ice and the opening up of shipping lanes that no human eye has ever seen before. That creation is growing like never before. But what does God's salvation plan, found in the Bible, reveal about our future? What does God's salvation plan, found in the Bible, reveal about our future? Does it agree with this somewhat bleak outlook I've, I've painted for you all this morning? Does it agree? <laughs> but when we immerse ourselves in the Bible story, God's new creation parts ways with any outlooks of ongoing degradation. God's story parts ways with any uh, outlook of ongoing degradation. God's future and the future that will come will not be one of extinction, but will be one of renewal and the making of all things new again. Renewal and the making of all things new again. So whilst the evidence in the environment and climate not to mention the political climate to God's people of Judah in 8th century BC, as to us today maybe, might seem a bit precipitous. When we immerse ourselves in God's word, we discover God's intentions for renewing creation, which includes renewing God's people as well as God's world. So this Isaiah passage, it kind of stimulates our imaginations, doesn't it? Uh, but whilst creation is frustrated by sin, God is providing an antidote, a way forward that will renew people and will renew his creation. And so what we see here is a great reversal, images of a great reversal in people and of creation. So we see the fullness of God's creation in people uh, here in the weaknesses of the bodies and in the fear uh, in people's hearts, weaknesses and, and fear. And then we see further weaknesses in the faculties of reception of eyes and ears that are blind and deaf. But then there's a change. These will be fully open. And the actions of leaping and singing will come for people who are lame and mute. Their lives will be transformed, will be radically turned around. So these are wonderful images that express what God's going to do in, in changing the fortunes uh, of people. And Isaiah then returns from images of human healing to images of creation itself healed. Uh, waters breaking forth in the wilderness and streams, where? In the desert of all places. Burning sand shall become a pool and thirsty grounds will become springs of water. How drought-stricken farmers across the land <coughs> across the world could do with God's promises made here becoming real in the here and in the now. But we know, don't we, whilst God's kingdom is here, it is both here and still to come. It is uh, uh, now, but it's also not yet. It's realised in part, but it's also uh, still fully to come. And so we go on waiting and we go on praying in hope that God will renew his creation uh, when he returns again to make all things new again. But let's drill down this. What are we to do in this period of God's kingdom being here now, partially, but yet still to come in its fullness? Uh, are we to pray like Prime Minister Scott Morrison asked us to pray for our drought-stricken farmers? Well, of course we are to pray. We're always called to be a praying people. But we're called to do much more than that. We are called to do much more than that. And over these next few weeks we'll be thinking about what concrete things we can be doing. Why are we to act? Well, because God has provided us with a direction, a way we are to go, a way for us to travel. But not just signposts, he's provided a person. He's provided the person of Jesus, who will lead us not only to pray, but also to act rightly in our world, to act. So in the midst of this prophecy in Isaiah 35, God's creation, uh, within God's creation, God's provided a, a highway 
a road, a direction for God's people uh, to travel on. Called here the Holy Way, describing the coming way of Jesus. And it's a wonderful image of what God will do in human history in sending his son. I think the main effect of this vision uh, is the rising of hope uh, in God's people. That um, amidst that political turmoil, that uh, God's instilling hope within uh, his people. Uh, theologian Alec Matia has written, Hope is a cordial the people of God need to keep them going. Hope is the cordial the people of God need to keep them going. Uh, many of you will probably remember a famous Aussie advertisement from Potty's Cordial uh, way back in probably the 1980s, where there's a young lad marching through the orchard. My dad picks the fruit that goes to Potty's to make the cordial that I like best. Remember that one? Bit of a classic. You can still get it on YouTube. I refreshed my memory the other day. Brought back many happy memories of Potty's Cordial. Uh, but it's the cordial of faith. That our God, our Father in Heaven, that gives us, He brings us the cordial of hope uh, into our lives to sustain us uh, in our journeys in following Him amidst all the change and upheaval that goes on uh, in our world. Hope that Isaiah 35 beautifully portrays for us uh, as a vision of God, what God will do in sending Jesus to restore our broken world. But how do we know that Jesus is this promised one? How do we know that Jesus is this promised one? Uh, this question was asked of Jesus as well when John the Baptist's disciples came to Jesus and asked, Are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? Do you remember what Jesus said in response to that question? He said, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight." The lame walk, those with leprosy are cured. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it, to Isaiah 35? So the change that Jesus brings about in people's lives becomes the testimony for Jesus' identity and proof of his credentials that he is the Messiah to John's disciples, that he is the one that God's prophets spoke about long ago. So when we come then to passages like um, uh, Mark chapter 7, verses 31 to 37, and the account of the healing of the deaf and mute man, we are aware of the promises that God made to his people long ago through the prophet Isaiah. That God would bring about personal transformation in people's lives. Uh, people whose lives have been uh, broken and destroyed through various impairments, blind, uh, the mute. And we'll see that it's through uh, contact with Jesus and Jesus' action in the world that their transformation uh, comes. So healing uh, in Jesus' day uh, and throughout the church and now is a sign of God's power and incoming kingdom breaking into our world. It's nothing really to do with a person who's praying for healing. Uh, we're just being kind of vehicles and servants and doing what God's asked us to do. But it's about God's power coming into the world and brightening the world or turning the world the right way up, the way it should be. So it's about God bringing transformation to the world. Jesus' liberation of the old fall of order acts as a bit of a signpost pointing the way. This is the way that things are going to go. Things aren't going to go on a downhill slope. Things are going to go this way towards what God is going to do with the world, towards renewing the world. So remember that when you're feeling a bit down and watch the news. That's not the way things are going to go. Things are going to go be renewed uh, again when Christ returns to raise the faithful from their graves and to judge evil and sin once and for all. God's going to renew the world. As uh, theologian Tom Wright says, its healing always was and is, and perhaps supremely so in Jesus' actions, a sign of God's love, breaking into the painful and death-laden present world. It was and is a pointer to the great healing that will occur when the secret is out, 
when Jesus is finally revealed to the whole world and our present stammering praise has turned into a full heart of song. So things are getting better. Things are getting better because what God will do in the world. So with this healed future in mind, I just feel I needed to bring a, a correction uh, today uh, to teachings or biblical ideas um, that speak about kind of a doctrine of a rapture that will happen in the will happen in the future. Because I feel that kind of goes against what the biblical narrative is teaching us today. Uh, so the doctrine of, of the rapture is taken from a couple of Bible verses that have been pieced together, largely Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 4. So I'll just read briefly uh, Matthew uh, 24 for you today. But about that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man, Jesus. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in a field, one will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken, and the other left. So what can be often taught from this passage is that when Jesus returns, believers will be taken from earth to heaven without dying, and non-believers will be left behind. There's been a whole bunch of money made on, on this erroneous teaching in America with various books and films and so forth. But the correction is this. Note the controlling statement in the passage. As it was in the days of Noah. As it was in the days of Noah. So it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. What happened in the days of Noah? The answer is, the evil ones were taken away, and the righteous ones were left behind and stayed. You see where I'm going with this? It's the righteous who were left behind and stayed to continue God's saving work here on earth and purposes here on earth. The conclusion, therefore, is that when Jesus returns, It'll be the righteous ones, the church, the ones who know Jesus, who will remain on God's renewed earth. And evil and evil ones will be judged and done away with, and with its suffering and pain and death and all that destroys and harms God's creation. That will be known. So do you see how the Bible speaks of a continual story of God creating the world out of his love? He loves the world. And he set uh, his purposes uh, in train uh, to call the people to himself uh, to work with him in restoring and bringing healing to God's creation. And that will continue on to, until Jesus comes again to finish the job. So there's all sorts of popular problems out there with this doctrine of, uh, of the rapture. Uh, and it also ignores in the same direction uh, that I've outlined passages such as Revelation 21. Uh, when God's new holy city, the new, Jeru the new Jerusalem, will come down out of heaven to earth. And God will reign here on earth. And again, we see how this will result in a renewed creation. So just briefly from Revelation 21, 3 to 4. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So you see how the Bible speaks consistently about God renewing creation, right, right through it, as creation that God loves. So the prophet Isaiah, in the midst of all this upheaval and change, provides a vision of healing uh, for creation and for people. The fulfillment of this vision starts with Jesus' coming and action in the world, as people are set free from their infirmities and from their sins. 
The people who find this way, this holy way, this highway, who find Jesus, become God's renewed people, becoming like living signposts, pointing the way forward to a renewed creation, saying to the world, this is the way we are to go. This is what God's going to do when Jesus returns to finish the job of making all things new again. And in response to this vision of new life that we've been given, let us continue to act uh, God's healing work of creation in people. Let us not just sit on the sidelines and wait for it to happen. Uh, like in the last verse of the carol, Once a Royal David City, <coughs> uh, a picture of when we're all in white, we'll just wait around. Well, I don't think that's what it's going to be like. <laughs> I don't want to be in white just waiting around. I want to be part of God's mission to renew creation and to renew the world, to fight for justice and righteousness for Jesus to bring in <coughs> his kingdom. So friends, let us work towards this day when, as the prophet tells us, when the dry land will be glad, when the desert shall rejoice, and the ransom of the Lord shall return in singing and everlasting. <coughs> Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word uh, that you gave to Isaiah and the word to us today. A uh, picture of healing our weaknesses, our frailties, our fears, uh, restoring sight to the blind, and helping the lame to leap for joy. The Lord, thank you that you have the power to do this. And we pray with this power in mind that you would be at work in restoring your world. But Lord, help us also to act, to do things that will help uh, to heal and renew your creation. Because we know, Lord, that your Bible says that you're going to return to finish this job. To destroy the works of sin, death, and decay and evil, and to bring in your kingdom of righteousness and peace. To restore your world fully, to turn desert conditions into flourishing events. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.